Yep. First Thessalonians, starting in verse 12. That's where we're going to pick it up here. And today, we're going to be talking about honoring our leaders. Um, you know, we've been through almost, almost the entirety. What was that? Do I got peanut gallery stuff already? <laughs> we just got started. Yeah. Me neither. And that's what makes it even more challenging to do what God says is when you don't like them. And we'll get to that because it's easy to, it's easy to honor people you like. It's hard to honor people you don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She was a little too passionate about that, huh? Yeah. 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 So anyway, we've been through almost the entirety, um, of this letter, and we've seen the overall premise that Scripture is giving us here. And I'm curious from you guys who have been here, well, even you that haven't um, and have been through First Thessalonians, like, what's the one thing that you take away from our time? If there's one thing that each one of you has that you've taken away from the book of First Thessalonians, what is that one thing? Rapture. Rapture. Nice. That's one I didn't think of. That's good. Rapture of the church. That's awesome. Anybody got anything else? Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. Okay. I love that. Come on, man. Think of some new stuff. I want the fresh stuff. I know you got something. Yeah. Anybody got anything else? No? What I really like is that we're supposed to live ready. Because he mentions that over and over again. At least coming like a thief in the night. That whole live ready thing, man. That, that, uh, that really is what I think is the overall theme of the whole letter. God is coming back. You need to be ready. And when he does come back, he has great things planned for us. Whether we're dead or alive at that time, he has great things planned for us. So that is awesome. Um, you know, because of this letter, I think our God has made sure that we're wholly and completely aware of what is coming. And not just this letter, but really the majority of the New Testament talks about this in some way, shape, or form, that the Lord is going to come back again, and this isn't it. This isn't all for us. He's got other things planned for us. Um, you know, for, for us in Christ, we have this great hope in him, whether we're dead or alive, and we're going to have this physical, bodily resurrection, each one of us. If we're dead, we're going to be raised physically and have that bodily resurrection just like those who are alive will have a bodily resurrection as well and get this new glorified body. Um, and, you know, the, the sad part about all this is that there is a separation here because for us in Christ, we have this great hope, but for those who don't have the Lord, like we mentioned a few weeks ago, they're going to awake to everlasting judgment. And there are these two things here, but none of us has any excuse to be not living for the Lord because the Lord has done so much just in each one of our lives. If, even if we take away this book that he's given us, the Lord has ministered to each one of us individually in a way that I think makes it almost impossible to say that you didn't have an opportunity to come to the Lord. That's how much he loves each one. Of, we're all his children. So he comes and ministers to each one of us individually and um, it, I, I love the stories that we get from, from uh, tribes that are like way out there and has, have no contact with the outside world. And yet their stories of like this Jesus guy that like came and ate lunch with them randomly. Like how crazy is that? How crazy that you get those stories from people who have never seen an outside person that only live, like they don't have radios, they don't have TVs, they don't have nothing. There's no way they could know and yet God went and met them where they were at. How incredible is that? So we, we don't have any excuse. Go ahead. I, I don't want to derail you or get off topic, so tell me, hey, maybe that's a question for another time. But okay. In your experience and your study, or maybe Calvary Chapel or whatever, mm -hmm. does the church um, talk about what they might consider the doctrine of hell to be? Mm. In other words, um, do we consider it, like you said, this eternal, eternal judgment thing? Mm -hmm. Is that... In your opinion, and your reflection, like mm. extreme hellfire torment mm. talk like the Bible gives, mm -hmm. or do you think perhaps it's something else, and maybe that's a question for another time? 
You know, it gives us a few uh, examples in scripture that I can just give you right off the top of my head. Um, it gives us, Jesus actually gives us the picture of the rich man and Lazarus who go to Sheol in the center of the earth and the rich man is in hell um, and the uh, poor man is in Sheol. And there's another name for this, a poyon. Uh, it, it's something, something like that. I just read this and I was like, wow. Uh, it's in Proverbs actually, where it talks about a separate place. And it's like, it, it means like the place of the destroyer or something like that. And I think a poyon is Greek for it, which is also, um, they, it talks about in Revelation, a poyon. Um, but yeah, so it talks about these two separate places and what it says in, in that particular story is that the rich man begged for Abraham to send Lazarus over to touch his tongue with just a drop of water to give him relief from the torment and, you know, the heat of everything. That's, that's the picture that it gives us. So um, to which Abraham responds, you know, I can't do that, number, namely because there's this big chasm in between these two places. They can see each other, right? <clears throat> Apparently, they can see and talk to each other, okay? But this, was, <clears throat> this particular story was metaphorical, right? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, and here's why I don't believe so is because it says when Jesus died, he went and ministered in the place of the dead in the center of the earth. So maybe it was metaphorical. Maybe Jesus just made up a story to give us this picture. But that doesn't mean that the place he was talking about is metaphorical. Um, also, he, he used uh, specific names. Yes, true. Typically not. Yeah. Right. If he would have said rich man and poor man, one then that's one thing. But. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago as well, where it says he was given the keys to death in Hades, and when he died and was buried in the grave, it says the, the graves of the saints opened up, basically paving the way for resurrection. And then as he is resurrected, the saints come to life, and they're walking the streets of Jerusalem. He's, he, it, it tells us that in a few different places in the gospel. So, it also mentions <clears throat> why somebody's crimes on planet Earth will be receive more stripes or fewer stripes based on the amount of crime they committed against our Lord. Yeah. So I was just wondering if there was, I, I haven't really yeah. seen anything to describe hell other than it's the worst of the worst. Sure. But I didn't know. If and it also, um, yeah. And that's, that's what it comes down to. And, you know, speaking to that, um, God is all these things. God is the physical manifestation of love, let's say. So apart from God, there is no love. Apart from God, there is no joy. There's no happiness. And so if you're eternally separated from God, you're not going to have any of those things that God is because he is the one who is those things and who gives us those physical and emotional manifestations in our own life. And it also, in Revelation, um, it also talks about the lake of fire, which is a different place. Because he takes, um, at that time, at the great white throne judgment, people will come up out of the earth. It says the sea will give up its dead, the earth will give up its dead, the rivers will give up its dead, and everyone will come to the great white throne judgment. And at that point, this is after, just to give you a timeline, okay, so we're after the tribulation, then um, the uh, uh, thousand year reign, absolutely, thank you, and then we have the great deception after that of where the devil goes throughout the whole earth and gathers the armies against the Lord again after that. Yep, he's released after the thousand. So he's thrown into the bottomless pit, locked in there. After the thousand years, he comes out, deceives the nations. They come against the Lord. And at that point, the great white throne judgment comes. Hi, Rebecca. So, um, yeah, and then after that, it talks about the lake of fire. That's final judgment, lake of fire. And it says, actually, all the way down to uh, death and hell, actually. So the place of the dead, Hades, is going to be taken and thrown into the lake of fire. So, 
yes, these are physical places. And, um, you know, even if, even if the story he told was metaphorical, the place is real. Um, so, and you get that from that picture in Revelation of him actually taking that physical place and throwing it into the lake of fire, another physical place. So, great question. Great question. And we're, we're going to uh, talk about this a little bit. And actually, this is a, a great excuse me, transition into this. Um, because, you know, God talks about these things very clearly. And I don't know if you guys realize this, but God doesn't stutter. God actually says these things and then says them again and then says them again and says them again so that we're clear. There are two separate places. And I know... A lot of people, including the Pope, like to say that there's not a hell and that there's not these two separate places and a loving God would never send someone to eternal damnation. But you have to understand, love is also just. And it wouldn't be just to those who chose to walk with God for them to be in the same place for those who chose not to walk with God. That's not just. So there has to be these two separate places um, and what it comes down to is if you serve God in this life, he's going to come and receive you unto himself. If you choose to serve yourself in this life, he's going to let you do that and let you be eternally separated from him. And that's what it comes down to. So, um, oop, did I just shut this off? Yep. Sorry. What? Will be separated from God? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because, I mean, like my, some of my, most, all my kids, you know, because they're my oldest children, but, mm-hmm. uh, most of them walked away. You know, when it comes to situations like this, I don't ever put God in a box because I'm not him and I don't have an opportunity to judge like he does, you know? Only God knows the heart and only God really knows what's going on in a person's life. Uh, and a lot of people bring up these conversations like once saved, always saved. Well, if they walked away, were they ever really saved? Who knows? God only knows that. So we have to trust God with those things. It's not our job to know. But the thing that I am so grateful for in my family, because uh, the vast majority of our family does not follow God. And I have to bear with this every day, basically, knowing that there's a good chance that a good majority of my family are not going to be in eternity with me and with the living God. And that's hard to take, I think, for each one of us. If, if we really sit and consider our whole families and how much we love them and knowing that God's hands are tied, so to speak, not that he doesn't have the ability to save, but if someone doesn't desire to be saved, what can he do? You know, if you go into a burning building and you're wanting to pull people out and they say, no, I'm going to stay here, what are your options? You don't have a lot. And it's unfortunate, and I'm sorry to use that example. I know that these these situations are um, very difficult for us to talk about. Um, And so I don't mean to to be rough and guff about this, but um, it, it, it is the truth. But I do know our God is so loving and he's so kind and he's so merciful. If you don't end up in heaven, it's because of you. It's not because of him. And that's sad to say, but some people just don't want to go to heaven. They don't want to relent and they don't want to be with him. They don't want to have the, uh, a Lord, so to speak. They don't want to have someone lording over their life as if he does that to us. They don't understand the freedom that he actually gives us as Christians. He's not lording it over us. Has anybody ever felt lorded over by God as a Christian? No. No one's ever felt that way. But they think that's what it is. They think they have this picture of God with a gavel in his hand, smacking people on the head with a Bible. No, that's not our God. God doesn't do that. God loves us and he's patient with us. He's kind, he's merciful, he draws us in. And um, so again, I I understand, and um, if I come off at all, like I'm not empathetic to these situations that I know we're all going through, trust me, I don't mean to be that way. 
because I have the same thing going on in my life that we all have going on in all of our lives because I don't think there's a person out there who could say their whole family is going to heaven. It's just not going to happen. Um, it would be a, a move of God and him only if that did happen. Now, I do pray for that almost every night. That is my prayer. Like, God, great revival in my family is what I'm asking for and nothing less. Like, I want every person saved. I'm not willing that any of my family should perish either. Like, I know that you're not. So, like, you, you know what you did in my life, God. You know how far I was walking and how much I didn't want you, and yet you still reached out and you saved me. And I know you can do the same for them too. So that should be all of our prayer for all of our family is, God, don't hold anything back. Save all of them, all of them. Um, because it's only by his grace, and that's the only thing that makes us different than anybody else is God's grace on our life. There's no, hi, Rita. There's no, um, there's no like uh, uh, kudos for being a Christian like you're better than anyone else because you're not. It's just that, we've accepted a God who is better than everyone else. And that's, what, that's the thing. So, so you know, the, um, the thing about hell is God told us that hell is real. He, he's given us these specific examples, but Jesus himself actually talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. And I think that's because of the severity of it. That's because he knows what's coming. He knows that he has to be just because it's who he is. And so... It's very real. It's a very scary thing. But the choice is ours. It's each one of ours. And it's totally under our control. It says elsewhere, other than that verse that says it's not willing, uh, God is not willing that any should perish, it says God desires that all would be saved. It says that. I think that's 1st or 2nd Corinthians that's, that that's in. He desires that all would be saved. So he's paid for it. He's given us the opportunity you know, it's like buying someone a car. <laughs> I paid for it. Do you want it? Some people wouldn't. I don't know why. But he's given you this free gift that you don't have to do anything for. And sometimes we just overcomplicate it. And we think, oh, this comes with a price. Well, yeah, it's going to cost you yourself. Are you worth it? Like, it, it? Are you worth it? Because I know God's worth it. I know I'm not worth it. The life that I want to live is not worth the life that God wants me to live because he is so much better. He says, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's true. That's who our God is. He loves us that much. Hi, Rita. Hi. How are you doing? Good. You little sharpshooter, you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So after this, we've been through all this stuff and... Scripture is going to transition in verse 12 back to, speaking of sharpshooters, it's going to, it's going to kind of uh, go through machine gun stuff. You know how uh, Paul's letters seem to be um, tailored like this. He goes through and he talks deep about a subject matter. And then at the end, it's like he's squeezing in everything that he didn't get to talk about in the letter. Boom, 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 boom. Do this too. <laughs> right? So that's kind of what, we're, what we'll be going through here starting in verse 12, and, and forgive me if this takes a few weeks to get through, um, but there's just so much here. There's, it's just, it's packed. So, uh, verse 12, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. The first thing we need to, or the first thing is that we need to respect those who are over us, our leaders, because we know ultimately our, our leaders are ordained by God. God has put leaders in their place to establish this hierarchy, this system of kind of a checks and balances type thing, okay, if we can use Americanese. It's a checks and balances type of thing, because he knows that these things work, okay, and if you look at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just in him and his trinity, you kind of see the same hierarchy too. Because the Holy Spirit says that his purpose is to point people to Jesus. And Jesus' purpose was to connect people to the Father. And so you see this hierarchy as well, even though none of them are less than another. You wouldn't say like, oh, 
the Holy Spirit is less than Jesus or Jesus is less than God the Father. No, they're all the same triune in nature. They're all one. But they establish this hierarchy, and so we get that picture. Roles. Roles. Like roles. Absolutely. And I, a lot of people have an, have a hard time with this whole Trinity thing. I don't just because I look at it like a building. If you have three people working on a building, they have different roles when they're building it, but yet they're all working toward the same goal. So I see it like that. Maybe I'm just simplistic and thinking I'm a construction worker, so I'm sorry if my analogies are simple. But yeah. I don't I don't find if this is inappropriate me asking questions, you tell me to shut up. Okay. It depends on the question. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Had, in, in your opinion, was he always the son? So that's simple. Yeah. Yeah. So the Trinity mm-hmm. is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. But I heard something suggested that Jesus Christ's equality with the Father is from everlasting to everlasting. Mm-hmm. But that he became the Son for our benefit, hmm. the incarnation of Jesus Christ, so as to be propitiation for us, becoming the Son. And assuming that role mm-hmm. at a point in time. I would love to see scripture on that. What's that? No modalism, not going into anything goofy, but I mean, yeah. as far as the, the role mm-hmm. with, in connection with the, you know, the ontological title that is given to Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. becoming the son. And I don't, I don't, I'm just going to ask you about it. Have you heard that or have you I would, considered I, I would think... Just, um, you know, going back over everything, that as God, all this being done before creation starts. Okay, so look at it from that kind of time frame. I 100% agree they're all the same. They're all, um, have the, they're all equal in that way. It could have happened that Jesus assumed the role knowing that someone was going to have to die for the people that he assumed the role to be born here and be that savior. It could have, but the the part that I'm having a hard time reconciling here is that it says God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that verse just keeps coming up in my head. So, and it also says somewhere, and I'm going to butcher this, but it talks about God being triune in nature and being fully, um, fulfilled in that relationship before so that he didn't need to do anything else. He didn't need us. He didn't need to create because he already had total fulfillment in that relationship. So it seems to me like I would love to see more scripture on that um, and, and where that comes from. I'm not going to say no, but there's, there's sure it would need to be a definite article to say Yes. You know, you see what I'm saying? Like right. to, to say that he assumed that role, you need to have a definite verse that says he was here and then did it, you know? Yeah, what that would indicate to me is that he has from everlasting to everlasting been the son. Yeah. That doesn't mm-hmm. diminish the um, um, equality he has with the father. No, not even one bit. Isn't the term son of man, isn't there a reference to Daniel? <coughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm not catching it. So that would be awesome. I would love if anybody has scripture on that. I would. That's a good one. No, I I appreciate questions um, because I I know that the Lord is working in what I prepare, but He's also working in everyone's heart too. And so there's there's a, a balance of both that we need to obviously dive into. You know. Do you have it, or should I go? Okay, come. we'll come back to you when it happens. Keep that in your back of your mind anyway. So ultimately, our leaders are ordained by God, and whether we like them or not, uh, whether we like them because they're a good leader or they're a bad leader and we don't like them, promotion is from the Lord, and no one is put into power unless he ordains it. He has established this hierarchy, and so... He is the one who's filling the hierarchy too. He's the one who puts all these leaders in their place. And no one is put into power unless he says yes. 
Um, and it's, I know it's easy for us in our lives to be mad when it comes personally to us. Let's say if someone is put in the position that we think that we should be in, it's easy for us to get mad and envious and angry about that situation and say to God, God, why aren't I in that position? Like, why did I get skipped over? I see you preparing me for that. I'm so good at it. I do such a great job, and yet you didn't give me that position. And look at them. Like, look at this person that got that position. They're totally stupid, and they don't know what they're doing. But yet, they're in that role. It's funny because that's what goes through our head, right? That's what um, our brain does to us, and it tries to totally separate us from the love of God. Because what it comes down to is God loves us so much that he puts us in the positions that he has us in and doesn't put us in the positions that he doesn't have us in. But, you know, what we all need to do when those situations arise is we need to have a confidence in what the Lord has for us. We need to have a confidence in the goodness of the Lord because the plan of our life is preordained by God. It tells us in Revelation that our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the earth. So before he even created anything, he had your life planned. He knew what was going to happen with you. And you can reconcile that whole predestination thing on your own. But what it comes down to is God knew you and God loved you enough to write your name down in a book and say, okay, this one's mine. And I'm going to do something special in their life. And it may not be what you think it should be, but ultimately it's what God thought it should be. Your, the plan of your life is preordained by God. And if God wants it, there's nobody on this earth that can stop it. Did you hear what I just said? If God wants it, there's nobody on this earth that can stop it. That means if God wants to put you in a place, in a position, there's nobody that can tell him no. And if he doesn't want you in that place, there's nobody that can tell him no. He's done all these things for us. And it doesn't matter what your pastor says or what the governor says or even what the president says. It's up to God. All these things are up to God. You know, Jesus was under the same type of hierarchy. He chose to be born under the law to redeem those under the law. Born to a slave girl. And you look at God and who he is and how incredible he is and you think, God, you chose to take pretty much the lowest seat possible. And yet, you had the most incredible life that anyone could ever have, anyone could ever live, that changed all human history from being born of a slave. And it shows you that positions don't really matter that much when it comes to the work of God. It doesn't really matter if somebody gives you a title and you have that plaque on your wall that says, I'm this guy, or I'm this girl. Look what I did. No, what matters is what God is doing in you. What work does God want to do in you? Because he's going to do something way more special than any person who gave you a plaque could ever do for you. He's got a greater plan for you. But Jesus specifically, and I, this, this story stands out in my mind because it's so amazing. He's talking with Pilate. Pilate's questioning him. And Jesus isn't answering him. And Pilate says to him, why aren't you answering me? I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay? So give me a break here. I know you like to go verbatim on me. I, my brain doesn't work that way, Shane, okay? He says, why aren't you answering me? And then he goes, don't you know I have the power to set you free or to kill you? At which point Jesus says, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. How powerful is that? How incredible is that? But it's the same for us in our lives too. When someone doesn't put you in the position that you think that you should be in, when someone doesn't recognize you in the way you feel like you should be recognized, knowing no, they would have no power over you unless it was given to them from above. God is the one who does these things. If you look at Jesus' life, it wasn't about titles. It wasn't about plaques on the wall. It was just about getting the work of God done. He said, I did nothing unless the Heavenly Father told me to do it. That was his purpose. And that can be our purpose too. 
whether we have the title or not. We don't have to have a big stage. We don't have to have uh, the, the platform to reach a lot of people if that's his call for you. His call for you is his call for you. And being in his will is where you're going to be used most effectively. If you're not in his will, whether you have a big platform or not, you're not going to be used effectively. There's a lot of big, well-known teachers out there who aren't being used like they could be used by God, even with all their ministry out there. And I'm saying this just speculating, but I know they're out there. I don't know specifically, but I know they're out there. Because when it comes to a stage... We all like the look of that. We all like the idea of people looking at us and, and um, building us up and looking up to us in a way that we feel respected in that way. We all want to feel that type of respect. But if it's not God's will for you, then it means nothing. It does nothing compared to what you could have been for him, compared to what he could have done in your life. Because the perfect will of God is the perfect will of God. And that's for your life and for my life. So our job is to trust God and be confident that he has good things for us and that he's going to put us in the places that were most effective, that he can use us the best. And that's what he did for Jesus, of course. And it doesn't matter who thinks they have power over you. They don't unless God gives it to them. Not the pastor, not the governor, not the president, not even your boss, not even your husband or your wife. God has power over us all. And that's something that I encourage myself with a lot because it happens. We feel like we can get skipped over. But remember that line that Jesus said, you would have no power over me unless it was given to you from above. Trust God with your life and for your life and know that he's got it all worked out. Trust in the Lord. There's so many reasons why God's, God puts people in certain positions and there's so many reasons why we don't get in certain positions. It may be that we're not ready for that position. It may be that the world's not ready for us to be in that position. And maybe God is still working out his perfect timing when it comes to these things. And maybe that he's got something better for you. And truly it is better for you. If it's the will of God, right? So trust the Lord. And, you know, this, this actually brings up a good, excuse me, brings up a good point when it comes to our culture. Because our culture says that we're only supposed to respect leaders if they do the things that we want them to do. And we see this in our government right now. They don't respect each other enough to realize that they're in the same position even. If you look at Congress, they're doing nothing and getting almost nothing done. And why is that? It's because they don't respect each other as leaders enough to say, okay, let's do whatever we can do for the good of the people. They're looking to boost themselves up instead of looking to build the country up like it should be. Like, let's better each other. Let's better this whole planet for ourselves. But I think pride gets in the way there. I think the ego gets in the way. You get on a platform and next thing you know, you have a little too much pull. Especially if uh, you're not being led by the Lord. Um, you know, it, it's not biblical though, in any way, to disrespect these leaders, no matter what happens. Because if, we're truly, if we truly believe that God has ordained the hierarchy, first of all, for us to be led by other people, and for uh, he has ordained those people to be in certain positions, then we have to trust that the Lord knows what he's doing, even if we don't like what that person is doing. And I think we kind of all got a, a great snapshot of this during this whole COVID thing, because I don't think anybody's thoughts were perfectly met by, you know, the ordinances that were put in place. But we just saw this massive work of God and what he was doing, no matter what the government did, no matter what happened with all that, we saw God working and moving. So even though maybe the election didn't go the way we planned it to go, didn't, didn't go the way we wanted it to go, maybe uh, the ordinance weren't put in place like we thought they should be, God was still doing a great work. 
and he's out there saving hearts and lives no matter what the government's doing. And he's drawing people to himself no matter what the government's doing. And matter of fact, he probably had a better opportunity, and that's why he did it this way, knowing the government is in the situation that they're in and doing the things that they're doing. Because I kind of felt this hunger from people like, oh, maybe we should start thinking about our lives and what this actually means and that we're not just here to be here. You know, there's something, there's a purpose for this. There's a purpose for the things that are going on. And so we got this great hunger, which I thought was incredible to watch just what God was doing. You know, it's, it's easy, like we mentioned before, it's easy to love good leaders who do what we want, and it's hard to love bad leaders who don't do what we want. But God has called us to respect the leader because of the position and not because of the person. He's put that person in there, but the position he's respected and he's called us to respect. And even if that person is not following the Lord, because let me tell you, there's many times that you can look back on Israel's history and God used kings from Gentile nations to go and give them a, a smack on the booty, let's say, and draw them back to him. Why did he do that? Why should another king from a nation that he hasn't called his children be known as a vessel of God? Why, why should they be known as someone who did the work of God? It's because he anointed them to go draw his people back to him. Does that blow your mind? That's how good our God is. He's got this whole thing under control. And it's not just with government, because this obviously happens in our homes too. Because God has set up this hierarchy in our homes as well between a man and a woman. Why has he done that? Because that's what he saw fit. And that's what it comes down to. And I know, I understand the situation. And I know everyone gets tense when we start talking about the spousal relationship. I understand. But yeah. you don't, God bless you, Mima. Yeah. Yeah, you sure do. You have the only her perfect husband, yes, just so you know. Right let, me, let me talk to you about this, too. Let me talk to you about this, Mima. Because what it comes down to is we all have the perfect husband. That's true. We do. It just depends on who you're looking to. God has set up this hierarchy in each one of our lives. And he has made the man the head to lead. Why has he done that? Because he saw it fit to do that. And it's good. What's that? And it's good. Yeah. He saw that it was good. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's funny, and I, I, I heard somebody say, I know this is a, a touch off topic and it's kind of a stretch, but, um, you know, in this relationship between a man and a woman, God has chose to identify himself as a man. If you read the Bible, it says he. And he created ma the male first and then created the woman to be with the man. And this whole crazy movement that's going on in our country right now is saying it's okay for anyone to be whatever gender they decide to be, even if it's not a physical gender, but yet they're mad at God for choosing to be a man. Does that make sense? Or is that the most ironic thing you've ever heard? It's, it's terrible for God to be able to choose to be a man, but if anybody else chooses to be a man, it doesn't matter who they are, then it's okay. Why is that? crazy, right? But you see, God chose it this way. And I've said before that I think it's because he knew what we needed. He knew that a lot of times women are more natural leaders and know what needs to be done and they just go and get it done. And a lot of times men don't have that same mindset and they're okay with things being a little off here and there. And if it's not prioritized to them, then they just won't do it. And we saw that with Adam and Eve. Because God told Adam, don't eat from that tree. But he never told Eve. It was Adam's job to tell Eve. And he got a little slack on that, so it seems. And then he decided to go with her down that road. So you see this perfect picture of what God sees of us. God knows that man needs to choose to lead, and it's can be difficult for him to do that, especially when his wife wants something. And he saw that a woman needs to submit, needs to understand that 
God is taking care of us all. And so that's what this com comes down to. Because who's the leader in your household? Is it the man? Is it the woman? No, it's the Lord. The Lord is the leader in the household. And he set up this hierarchy because he knows this is what we needed. He knows that he wanted that man to step up and lead, and he wanted the woman to trust him in following. And I know it's not easy to follow weak leaders, and I know that a lot of men are weak leaders. It's much easier to follow a strong leader than it is a weak leader. But what does it do when you're following a weak leader? It points your eyes to the Lord, right? Because you're like, oh God, we're like a train running off the tracks here. But if your man's got it all in control, then what do you say? Oh, yeah, my man's really doing a good job. This is good. I don't think we need anything else. So you see this picture of what God is doing. God is pointing us all to him. And he knew this was the best way to do it. Because this is the way that kind of gets us all a little riled up, doesn't it? It gets us all a little cringy. He loved us enough to point us to himself. God bless you, Rita. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, my allergies are so bad. That's okay. That, no, we'd love to have you here. So, all these things are preordained by the Lord, and we have to trust the Lord in it. He is the only perfect husband for not only women, but for man. And for a man, he's going to be our husband. So you got to get used to being the bride too. you got to get used to submitting. That's what we all need to do. If the man, even in leading, isn't submitted to the Lord, then we're all in trouble. The whole family's in trouble. And if the woman isn't submitted to the man who's submitted to the Lord, then we're all in trouble too. He set this thing up so that it works well, and if we would just do it, then we're all in good shape. But he knows that we don't want to, and we have to trust him with it. Just like we trust him in our daily lives, just like we trust him in the positions that he put us in, just like he trusts uh, or we are supposed to trust him in the positions of our bosses and our political leaders and our pastors. We need to trust him with all those things so that really things are going to be okay. Because like I just mentioned, a lot of times he's putting those, people's, those people in that position so that we look to him and not to them. We look to him instead of looking to our politicians to save us. Isn't that what happened with Trump? So many people were looking at Trump. Trump's going to save us. No, he's not. Jesus is going to save you. And he's the only one who can. So we look to him. Let's touch on verse 13 here. And I'm going to read verse 12 just because they kind of go together. If I can get, okay, apparently. Okay. It decided that it wanted to refresh right now. So, okay. Okay, so let's... Uh, Touch on verse 12 here real quick too. Okay. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. So esteem your leaders highly. It goes even farther. It's a respect, but it's also a lifting up saying, okay, we need to get behind these guys. We need to get behind these ladies if they're in that position and say, hey, we're behind you. We understand you're not perfect. We understand you're not going to make all the best decisions, but we trust our God with you. And we trust our God with us. And even as a man, it's our job to submit under our leaders, showing that we trust God. You see this picture that God sets up? We're all submitted under him no matter if we're a man or a woman. So we look to him no matter who's over us. And let me tell you, it's not easy to be a leader. It's not easy to be in the political climate in this day and age. It's not easy to be a pastor in this day and age, as we know. And I know a lot of times these positions look glamorous from the outside. And we all think, wow, that person's so cool and they look like they got it all together and their life is so great and I'd love to do that. But let me tell you, that's not the truth. It's not. Not for any of them. No matter how good it looks on the outside, that's not the case. You know, I worked, uh, a lot of you know this, I worked for a plumbing contractor in high school. And when I was working for the plumbing contractor, I learned that poop flows downhill. 
That's basics of plumbing, okay? But I realized that when you're a leader, the laws of gravity don't always apply. Meaning that a lot of times as the leader, you're the one who has to deal with all the, you know. And what you'll learn about being a leader um, is that it happens to all of them. They all have to deal with the poop. And a lot of times there's more poop than there is good stuff. And that's a bummer to say, but it's the truth. God is pointing us all toward him. He isn't allowing leaders to be more puffed up than they ought to be. Not for long, at least. I mean, how many pastors do you know that are all high and mighty, and then next thing you know, they tumble down pretty far? It's because he's pointing us all to him, and he cares about us all individually. And I was talking to a guy, and I'll, I'll leave him nameless. Um, I was talking to a guy at the men's retreat just about his situation with him and his wife. Um, and the whole premise around the conversation is that no matter what your relationship looks like with you and your wife, whether you're together or, or separated or divorced or whatever it looks like, God is doing everything he can to draw you to him as an individual. Because it's not being married that saves you. It's not being married that grants you your salvation. Now, God says it's a good thing. A man who finds a wife finds a good thing in favor from the Lord, Scripture tells us. But your salvation is between you and him. It's not between your husband or your wife and him. So if he has to separate you to get you both to come to him, he'll do that. If he has to let one of you go to let the other one come to him, he'll do that. His goal is is that all of us would come to him. That's what he's trying to do. And so in our relationships, it's our job to make the Lord the center. It's our job to make him the leader. It's our job to point each other toward him. Because if you let your relationship draw you away from the Lord, then he will draw you away from your relationship so that you come back to him. It's a scary thought. But God loves us that much. He loves us that much to care for us in that way. Hi, Marissa. This is awesome. We're getting just like so many visitors coming in. What a huge blessing, right? Hi, Marissa. <clears throat> oh, wow. Aw. Hi, Marissa. I missed you. I missed you too. Hmm. Hi, this is so sweet. Awesome. Let's just be done, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway love on your leaders trust God he's got it all under control he does yeah he's got it all under control he's got you where he wants you and if it wasn't up to him then no one would have any control over you at all remember that line that Jesus said if it wasn't given to you from above you would have no power over me and that's the truth. That's the truth for each one of us. God is your strong tower. God is the one who's over you. And there's no person that's over you unless he sets them in their place. So God, we thank you. Thank you for encouraging us in your word and by your word and by the way that you live too. Like you didn't just come back and uh, just step into a kingly position and say, hey, let's do this. I'm the king. No, you said, no, I'll play the game. I'll do the hierarchy thing. Matter of fact, I'll start at the bottom. I'll, I'll start at the lowest of the low. And I'll show you that I am fully submitted to the will of God because I know that it's perfect. That's the example that you set for us, Jesus. And I pray that that's the example that we would follow. That whether we're in the highest of highs or the lowest of lows, that we would be submitted to you in your perfect will for us. We're so grateful for you, God. So grateful for your example and so grateful for what you're doing in each one of our lives. We ask that you would just allow us to submit to you. Allow us to submit to our leaders. Allow us to respect them and esteem them, whether in the home or outside of the home, God. We look to you and we're so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord.